NTU World of Wisdom. Welcome to High Impact Thesis. In this podcast, we speak with researchers from various scientific fields to talk about the motivation, goal, and potential impact of their research. We also want to give you a sense of how a PhD is carried out with an emphasis on the PH, the philosophical aspects involved in pursuing a PhD. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the HID podcast. Uh, Today, we have a very special guest, one of three special guests, in fact, uh, Mohamed Ibrahim, which is one of the founders of this podcast. Uh, Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And our hosts today are Malik and Ahmed Hussain. So why don't we get right into it? So we'll maybe we should uh, maybe we should mention that we'll ask you a little bit about the podcast towards the end. You know when we go over your interests mm-hmm. and everything. Sure. Um, just as an insight to students that want to set up something like this. You know, mm-hmm. set up an activity um, in their school or in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but for now, sure. let's let's get into your uh, research field. So, like, the, the broadest explanation you can give for your research field. All right. All right. So, uh, my PhD research in general was on perovskite solar cells. So, these are a new kind of uh, emerging uh, photovoltaic technology. Um, so, I think it's helpful before I dive deep into that to first share some um some background to give you an idea about the landscape of the solar cell technologies that exist out there. So uh, if we look at the solar cell technologies, we have mainly three generations of solar cells. So we have the first generation, early early generation of solar cells, um, uh, which be, be, be mainly consists of uh, silicon-based solar cells. So we have uh, polycrystalline and um, um, monocrystalline silicon-based solar cells. So these are still, uh, until now, they are the dominant uh, type of solar cells uh, in the market. And next after that came in the thin film solar cells or the second generation of solar cells. So these are a little bit uh, cheaper to produce, uh, lower cost, and they're quite good in terms of performance and efficiency. So these include examples such as uh, uh, silic- um, uh, CIGS solar cells. So this is, stands for copper indium gallium sil- uh, uh, ars- uh, copper indium gallium arsenide, I think, uh, or selenide. Sorry, sorry, CIGS. Yeah. And then we have uh, cadmium telluride based solar cells. We have amorphous silicon. These are different from the crystalline uh, silicon solar cells. Then after that came in the third generation of solar cells, which is basically. Uh, includes things such as uh, quantum dot sensitized solar cells and dye sensitized solar cells, a, a lot of different, uh, also uh, organic photovoltaics based on polymers, polymer materials, and perovskite solar cells. So the kind of uh, solar cells that I've worked with are belong to the third generation. They are the emerging, emerging kind of uh, solar cells. So yeah, I'll be talking more about that in this episode. Great. Perovskite devices, yeah. So with with each generational leap, uh, I'm imagining there's like a better performance, better efficiency. Well, in terms of um, in terms of performance, not hundred percent, but in terms of reducing the cost, yes, definitely. So, for example, the CIGS solar cells and the Sky, they are much much cheaper to produce compared to the older generations. So this is the main advantage I think of them. But for the Proskites. Until now, they already achieved a really impressive efficiency that's on par with the traditional silicon-based uh, solar cells. So they're really promising. That's as well as cost, I imagine. Of course, maybe you can produce them less than half of, of the cost of uh, yeah, of pros- of uh, sorry, silicon-based solar cells. I see. Yeah. So the the kind of solar cell that you can just buy off like Alibaba or something, mm-hmm. like what is what is that most likely to be? Sure. So that's most likely to be either uh, uh, mono or polycrystalline silicon solar cells. So they are like, I think they have more than 80% of the market share nowadays. Yeah. So it's most likely to be one of one of those two. So still like first gen. Uh, yeah, still. They are the dominant in the market. Yeah. And is there a reason why the other ones have not like come into... Come, mm, I'm not sure about the real, re- about that, like the reason and I can give you an idea about why, sure. why is that the case yeah. yeah not sure yeah yeah um all right so 
you mentioned quantum dots. Yeah. And that makes me think of my research, which is like fluorescence and mm. like spectroscopy and so on. Sure. So what's the, aren't quantum dots for like making or, or like generating light? Yeah, yeah. I mean, quantum dots, they can be used for both either for photo detection and, uh, uh, and solar cell application, like for absorbing light and generating some kind of electric current, either for photo detection or energy uh, production. They can also be used for emission. So nowadays they're also employed in, uh, for example, uh, TVs, displays. They're quite good for that, uh, that kind of application. Um, yeah, there are many other applications for quantum dots as well. Right. Yeah. So this whole field is like uh, analogous to either you're generating light or you're uh, generating light. a signal. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. right. right. And, so, and uh, what, what are quantum dots exactly? All right. So quantum dots are materials. So basically they are... Uh, nanoscale dimensional semiconductors. So basically you have, you can imagine a spectrum where we have a bulk material, three-dimensional material, and then on the other side of the spectrum we have a, a single molecule or uh, an atom. Quantum dots fall somewhere in the middle. They are sim So basically the main idea behind quantum dots is that they are so small in terms of size, like nanometer, single digit nanometer size particles, that give them special properties due to the size, due to the quantum confinement effect, when, when electrons are trapped within a, within a small scale material, they have, they like, uh, they will show a certain behavior in terms of absorption and uh, emission. So yeah, basically you, by changing the size of a quantum dot, you can tune its property, it's uh, the color it, it can emit, for example, or absorb, just by changing the size, not the material. So that seems pretty versatile. I, I know this is kind of adjacent to your field, yeah. but uh, that seems pretty like a pretty good candidate, right? Yeah, I, like for what application you are you're talking? For any kind of like tunability, right? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. That's the main advantage, I think, of quantum dots. Yeah, they're quite tunable. And what property do they uh, contribute to in terms of like solar, solar cells? Uh, basically absorbing of, of light. Yeah, mainly absorbing light. Mm. Yeah, absorbing the light, yeah. And also emission, of course, as in uh, LED applications and TVs and so on. Yeah. But for a solar cell, you would want the quantum dots to have absorption in a specific wavelength range? Or... Usually, yeah, yeah, usually. You can't like have it absorb the entire spectrum, like uh, three-dimensional materials. Also, I'm not, uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not an expert on, <laughs> on quantum dots, yeah. Sure, sure. So where do perovskites come in now? All right, so... Perovskites offer a wide variety of advantages. So we have, um, first of all, the cheap cost, uh, like the low cost of production. Uh, beside that, the high efficiency. So in a, like within one decade, perhaps, 10 or 11 years, they already achieve the same efficiency that you get using uh, silicon-based solar cells. So this is quite impressive. Um, so yeah, they offer so low cost, high efficiency, and also tunability, you can also tune the absorption. For example, you can use them in in conjunction with the silicon solar cell in a tandem device. So a tandem device contains multiple layers of materials that absorb light. And usually you will have one material that absor absorb a certain spectrum, a certain range, and the other material will, absor will absorb another part of the spectrum, yeah. So yeah, this is the general overview of, of Proskite devices. And when you're talking about efficiency, either for first gen or third gen, like what are what are the kind of numbers you're? All right, so I think for for silicon based devices, you can, op, like you can get above twenty percent efficiencies nowadays in the market, uh, especially for monocrystalline, polycrystalline. You can also get eighteen and above. You can easily get that. Now third generation, I think they are in the teens, like thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, in this range. But Proskite, they already achieved, I think the record efficiency is around 25.7 up to the, this day. Actually, you can go online and if you Google um, N, NREL, NREL, um, Best Research Cell Efficiency Chart, so you'll, you'll get a, an up-to-date chart which shows you the record efficiency for every, every type of solar cells, like across the last four decades. So you'll see the progression of each technology. Yeah. Oh, it's a nice resource. Yeah. Um, so what are perovskites as a material like okay. compared to silicon sure. or quantum dots? 
Yeah. So, all right. So the the name Proskite itself it 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 comes from the uh, the name of a Russian uh, mineralogist. His name is uh, Lev Prosky. So uh, uh, so basically, he discovered uh, an a nat- or he discovered I think and described a natural mineral. It's mainly uh, c- calcium titanate, I think. Uh, so this this mineral has a certain structure or an arrangement of atoms uh, that we refer to as proskite structure. So basically, proskite materials are the materials that have the same structure that we find in uh, the natural mineral calcium titanate. So so this uh, so there are a wide variety of proskite materials, but a certain subset of proskite materials are suitable for applications in solar cells. So these are mainly uh, you can refer to them as uh, organometallic halide proskites to differentiate them from other types of uh, proskite materials. Yeah. So when uh, you so when you think of like silicon solar cells, right? They have a very uh, narrow window where they absorb um, energy, like uh, yeah, energy, photon energy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So with perovskites, you're saying they have better efficiency. So is that window like larger? Sure. So basically, they have, I mean, in terms of absorbing light, they have a very, we call it high extinction coefficient, how effectively the material absorb the, the incoming light. So they have a, a really good extinction or absorption coefficient across a wide range in the solar spectrum. And the band gap is tunable. You can change the band gap. Okay, I want this, uh, this material to absorb only below the blue color, for example, and ultraviolet. I want it to absorb all the way until the red color, for example. So it's tunable in that regard. Um, I think silicon has a band gap. We will talk more about that. Has a band gap of around 1.12, something like that, electron volt. However, perovskite materials generally have a band gap that starts from 1.55 or 1.5 all the way up to 2. Point. You can tune it and increase it above 2 electron volt. So this is the unit used to measure the band gap. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this is a general idea. Also, they have, um, in terms of the attractive properties, they have a, um, a good electron and uh, and hole transport. So they have a good uh, mobility, electron and hole mobility, which is very important for solar cell applications. Yeah. Right. Right. I think that's a pretty good overview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then, where do you come in in this whole picture? All right. Um, so I, I think perhaps before I, I dive deeper into my own work, I think maybe it it, it will be useful to give the listeners an, an idea or about the operation mechanism of solar cells, mm-hmm. just to give them an idea. Sure. So basically, in a perovskite solar cell, a typical perovskite uh, device, you will have a perovskite layer, a material, mainly yeah, as as we talked about, a perovskite material, a layer, a thin layer of a perovskite material, which is sandwiched between two materials. One is called electron transport material, and the other one is called hole transport material. So, so when, the hole transport in the bottom? Uh, you can have both both kind of arrangements. So the, mm. you can have the electron on the bottom, and then you can have the hole on the bottom. Both of them are, are viable. So, so the main thing, uh, the incoming light will come and excite the electrons in the perovskite material from the valence band. So this is the energy level in which the electrons usually are present during, like in, in the, to form the bonds. So they are present in the valence band. So the incoming light, if it, if it, uh, if it is of a sufficient energy to excite the electron from the valence band to the conduction band, then an electron will be excited and it will go up to a higher energy level in the conduction band where it can move, move freely in the, in the material. Now in the valence band, this vacancy created by the electron is referred to as a hole. It's a positively charged, I don't know, fictitious entity. Yeah. And uh, on the top, we have the, pos- we have the negatively charged electron. So now, after generating an electron hole pair, we need to extract them uh, as quickly and as effectively as possible from the proskite layer before they get lost. So basically, the electron transport material will the, the electrons, after they're generated in the proskite material, they will get transferred into the electron transport material, only the electrons, and the hole will be blocked. On the other side, on the other material, the hole will be extracted by the hole transport material and the electrons will be blocked. 
So the main idea, we want to do that as fast as possible so that the electron will not recombine and get lost again. So our enemy number one in, in solar cell research is a process called uh, non-radiative recombination, whereby the electrons generated, um, the electron hole pairs that are generated by the light recombine again. So this process is usually mediated by the presence of um, defect or trap states. So basically you have a conduction band, valence band. Uh, yeah, valence band and conduction band. In the middle, there shouldn't be any state where an electron can occupy. It should be empty, a forbidden uh, band. So what happens in actual materials is that there are a lot of def defects. So the presence of these def defects would usually introduce uh, states within the band gap in the middle. So these will assist electrons to recombine back to the valence band if they are present uh, at an excessive amount, like excessive uh, amount within the material. So, so basically a lot of people are trying to mitigate this issue of uh, recombination. Non, we call it non-radiative recombination. So basically an electron will recombine without producing any visible light photon. So basically, my, my, uh, the part of the research I've done was about trying to um, apply certain treatments or modification to the proskite layer itself in order to modify its morphology. So basically, the morphology is, is uh, something like the grain size. I'm not sure if you are familiar with this term. So basically, if you look at the proskite material under a microscope uh, or under a scanning electron microscope, you will be able to see that there are grains, grains like small grains that are connected together. So on the grain boundaries, usually what happens is that you have a high concentration of defects, which means a high concentration of traps that would assist in the loss and recombination of electrons. So basically I've done a certain treatment and tried to increase the grain size, dramatically increase the grain size, and this will, would limit the the density of the grain boundaries will reduce the number of grain boundaries within the film itself. And so this will, in, in many ways, can help in, limit, in, limiting the, in limiting the recombination and also facilitating, it would help us facilitate electron extraction. So electrons will move easily without facing grain boundaries. So this is part of the research I've done. And so when you're talking about uh, surface defects, do you literally mean, like, if you look at it in SEM, it, it just looks rough? Uh, no. Surface defects, I'm talking about um, atomic level defects. So basically, a missing molecule, a mol uh, oh, sorry, a missing atom, an atom in a place where it shouldn't be, uh, unsatisfied bond, like you have a dangling bonds, they call them. So on the surface, you have bonds, then there's nothing. So there will be unsatisfied bonds, which might introduce... Um, the, uh, trap states in certain cases, depending on the material and, and so on. And these occur in otherwise crystalline arrangements, right? They're supposed to be perfect. Yeah, usually in an ideal material, crystal, crystalline material will have a perfectly ordered atoms. But in reality, unfortunately, will have defects. So. And is there a cause, like an identified cause for this? I think it, it primarily comes from the fabrication method, from the fabrication process, like it's largely unavoidable in a certain way, but people try to medic mitigate them by doing also passivation, where they, where they try to like add certain dopant materials to satisfy those f vacancies or to fill or to satisfy unsatisfied bonds, like to partially try to fix that issue. Yeah. How, how effective is that? I think, generally speaking, it's quite effective. Like people have tried different materials and... Uh, like generally speaking, if you look at the literature, it's widely applied. The passive, like uh, there is a wide variety of passivation strategies and methods, and generally speaking, they t they seem to be quite effective in improving the performance as well as the stability also. So, how big of a factor is recombination? If you were to talk about like efficiency, for example, it's really really important, really big, because uh, like the majority of loss that happens is due to non-radiative recombination. It's number one enemy. Yeah. So, so if, is it the case that you're down from 100 to like... Uh, okay, uh, so usually there is a theoretical limit 
for solar cells. I think for proskite, they have done the calculations. I think it's somewhere around 30, 31.5%, if I remember correctly. But now the efficiencies are like, people are getting 20, 21. The record is 25.7, so we still have some room for improvement. So the majority of that loss is due to recombination, yeah, non-radiative recombination. Do you have any idea where that theoretical limit come from, comes from? Um, I think they have done calculations based on the band gap of the material mainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for, for silicon, you will have a certain theoretical limit. For proskite, you might have a different theoretical limit. So yeah, there, there's a way to do calculations that are based on the, on, on the solar spectrum of the sun that reach the Earth and the band gap of the material. So they can do certain analysis and come up with a, with a number for that. So that's like the maximum. Yeah, efficiency. theoretical possibly. Yeah. Oh, so if, if it's limited by the solar spectrum, I guess there's no material that could, you know, have a pretty high efficiency because the solar spectrum is quite, is quite broad. Mm, it's quite broad, yeah, but uh, I'm not sure. Like, uh, like you're trying to say, because the solar spectrum is limited... Um, it's quite broad, so yeah. th it's very unlikely that there's a material that can take... Uh, oh, yeah, of the entire, exactly, exactly, exactly. Entire spectrum, yeah, right. Exactly. So, for example, proskites, they can absorb light uh, up to, I think, eight, uh, 750 to 800 nanometer. So, this is uh, around red, above red, infrared, yeah. 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 This is the maximum they can gain, like, from 800 and then all the way to ultraviolet. So, isn't most of the energy in the ultraviolet region? From the sun, or is it is it the other is it the other way? Is it mostly in the IR? Well, I think um, like the ultraviolet energy or the ultraviolet ultraviolet photons, they have higher energy. Yeah, that's right. But I think the majority of the solar spectrum leans toward the like the green and above. Yeah, like from the five hundred. Like if you look at the spectrum, you can check it out. You will see that the the peak is around. In the green, 500, if I remember correctly, in this range. So less energy, but more photons. Yeah, more photons, exactly. exactly. And uh, at least in my research, I've come across detectors that go like really far into IR. That's right. That's right. Yeah, there are a lot of people trying to uh, work to develop um, IR detectors that go into mid and far infrared IR, area. Yeah. But they are using, like I think... Two two dimensional materials, two D materials to achieve that, yeah. And those are not uh, good for energy generation, because no, no, they're maybe they they can assist in some ways, like to help us passivate the, the or modify the interfaces, but as a light absorbing material in themselves, no. I see. So so passivation is one way. Is that what you're doing, or are you trying different things? Basically, my. Uh, my work was mainly not on using certain chemicals to pacify the defect, but on modifying the morphology itself. So when we eliminate uh, the, gra the grain boundaries, this would result usually in an improvement in performance, as I've mentioned, due to um, facilitation of electron and, and hole transport, and also limiting the, the recombination that might take place at the boundaries, if you have a lot of boundaries in the material. And your approach to this was? Uh, okay, so basically I used a, a solvent. So basically I used a mixture of solvents, of two solvents. And then while preparing the proskite material itself, after like, so we, we use a method called spin coating. We spin the, 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 the proskite material from a solution. So I forgot to mention, this is one of the big advantages of proskite solar cells, is that you can fabricate them using solution-based methods, which are cheap. So this one, one, one more advantage. So yeah, back to the point. Uh, so after spin coating the proskite material, I do certain treat treatment where I keep it in, a, where I keep it enclosed within an atmosphere that's rich in, a, in, in the vapors of certain solvents, of a mixture of solvents. So basically, you can call it um, solvent vapor annealing, basically. So after you spin coat it, you put it in a hot plate to heat it for a while. And at the same time, I kept it within a solvent-rich environment. And so this would assist in the growth of larger crystals or, or larger grains. Yeah. 
but you don't want grains. No, no, larger grains mean less grain boundaries. So if you, in the same space, if you have larger grain, mean less grain, grain boundaries, yeah. I see, yeah. I see. Mm-hmm. Like reducing the contact Exactly, areas. the contact so, areas between yeah. two grains. Yeah. I see. So where, where did this begin? Like, how did you get the idea to apply this method? Uh, so, there have been some works, like previously, using solvent vapor annealing. Uh, what I have done differently, like they have done some work on that, trying to do some morphology modifications. Uh, but what I have done is mainly use the mixture. So, what I have done differently is I used the, you can call it an anti-solvent. So, usually they use a solvent, a polar solvent. I use the mixture of a solvent, of a polar and non-polar solvent both together and modified the ratios to tune the morphology in different ways. So basically, I, this is the kind of, of thing I've done a little bit differently in this regard. Mm. So this is part of of the research I've done. I've also done another part. <laughs> which you can oh, talk about. please, yeah, yeah go on. Uh, so yeah, the second part was mainly I tried to <clears throat> I tried to develop a new approach or a new method to help us identify within a given proskite device to identify the sites or the location at which an excessive rate of recombination might be taking place within the device. So to do that, I've basically, so there is a method that's commonly used in solar cell research. It's called uh, impedance spectroscopy. So this method, they use it to study the the recombination process in, in the working proskite device. So they, for example, put it under light and then do the measurement. It will give them a sense of the rate of recombination. So you can use it, for example, to compare different treatments, like with a given treatment and without, and you can observe the change in the recombination rate. So basically I've done, what I've done is I, I applied this method. Usually people will, would, uh, would illuminate the, the module, the solar cell, from one side and do the measurement. What I've done is I have done dual side characterization. Basically, I do the measurements when the solar cell is illuminated from this side and then do another measurement when it's illuminated from the other side. So to do that, I had to uh, prepare a special kind of device which have a semi-transparent top electrode. Usually, it's not transparent. So I made a device which is transparent from both sides. And then uh, when you do the characterization from both sides and do the comparison, then you can reveal some important information about the recombination process, uh, which interface might be problematic, how does this material contribute to the performance or limit the performance, and so on. Yeah, this was another part of, of my research. So is the single-sided method uh, not accurate? Is it... No, it's accurate. It's useful and accurate. It's widely used, but I try to expand on that to use it in a different way that might reveal more information. And if you are measuring the same cell from the front or the back, the back. side, it's the same. You might notice some differences. And right. that's, that's, that's the useful part. So if you see differences, okay. So I have an idea, maybe this interface is more problematic. We need to do more work to improve this particular uh, interface, to passivate it, to do some interface engin- engineering, they call it sometimes. Yeah. And you want both sides to be as good as, as, good as possible. I see. Because usually the majority of the loss takes place within the within the inter- interfaces. The majority of the loss, especially in proskite devices, so we have losses within the bulk of the proskite material itself, and we have losses that take place at the interfaces between the proskite and the transport material, the electron or hole transport material. And once you identify a problematic area, and I'm guessing this is on the or- on the scale of you know uh, atoms or, or so on. You basically. Like you basically don't uh, uh, identify an area, you identify the interface. Okay, the interface between the perovskite material and this material, let's say titanium oxide, is problematic. We need to do some more engineering and some work to try to improve it. Oh, the interface as a whole. As a whole, exactly. I see. Yeah. So the next time you make another cell, you would manage that. You will try to yeah manage that and do some interfacial engineering and improve the... And so I'm guessing you have multiple interfaces in one cell? Yeah. So basically you have you have mainly two important interfaces, generally speaking. You have the perovskite and the interface between the perovskite and the electron transport material 
as well as between the perovskite and the whole transport material. These are the main interfaces that govern the performance of the device. Yeah. But usually, yeah, you have uh, you have extra layers. You have the gold on top. You have the an FTO transparent conducting site on the bottom. But uh, yeah, these and are the two main interfaces. The, the other ones don't affect your. Yeah, they are not uh, problematic as the perovskite interfaces. Yeah. Right. So can you talk more about the, the actual method? Like, what are you probing for and what do you, like, what's your output once you put your cell inside? Uh, like you're talking about uh, this dual side characterization? Yes. All right. So, so basically, I mean, the main idea is that uh, when you illuminate the device from one side, let's call it the electron transport material side. Okay. So you will have the performance or the rate of recombination primarily governed by the interface between the electron transport material and the perovskite because it's near near to the incoming light. Because as you go into the perovskite material, the, the absorption decays exponentially. So the majority of photocarrier or the whole pair generation takes place at the near the interface. So if you characterize it from this side and then using a PDF spectroscopy, and for the sake of uh, explaining things, let's assume that you got a value of recombination value or recombination rate of 100, for example. Do the same measurement on the other side, on the whole transport material side, and you get... Uh, uh, so basically, if the whole transport material, the other side, is more defective, more recombination will take place. So basically, you will need to increase the light more to achieve the same power output you got from the electron transport material because this interface causes more losses. So when you do the measurement from this side and from this side under the same output, you can probe the difference in the recombination rate from the two interfaces. You can see it, you can visually see it in the output of the impedance, of the impedance spectrum, spectroscopy. Yeah. And so is recombination, I'm guessing there are other factors at play. Um, to the efficiency that you get, right? Like you shine your light and you get an output, mm -hmm. but that's dependent on multiple factors, not just recombination, right? Of course, of course, yeah. Like the band gap of the material, the hole and electron transport uh, mobilities in the proskite material and in the uh, electron and hole transport material. So a lot of factors uh, come into play. So you need to have isolated all of these other factors beforehand? Not really. I mean, not really. They have an effect, an effect, but like generally speaking, the interfaces are the main critical bottleneck, or main critical problem that we need to work out. Yeah, this. Yeah, I, I understand what you are coming, what you are trying to say, but uh, the the effect is not as important or as significant as the recombination of the interfaces. I see. And can you use um, the same testing method, like dual sided testing method? for other like commercial cells should be applicable yeah should be applicable before they're like you know completely packaged no no you do the you, you do the characterization on a complete device yeah so this is one of the advantages of this approach is that you fabricate the entire device you put it under light under realistic operation conditions more or less and do the characterization so it will reflect the behavior of the device more accurately yeah hmm so where along your uh, research kind of project did you decide like, hey, we need a better testing method? Like, how do you come about that? Um, well, generally speaking, I was trying to do some, do some work on uh, semi-transparent devices. Like my, uh, my supervisor like, suggested an idea, a specific re research idea that we can do. And this slowly, a bit by bit, evolved into the kind of research that I ended up doing at the end. Like, I didn't think of the method from the beginning. Only after I made the same transparent device and thought, oh, okay, maybe we can do this, and then started doing the experiments and simulations and, and all of that to, to achieve it. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So did you actually then go on to improve those? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so... Issues, or or you just stopped at... Uh, yeah, I, I, I only ma mainly focused on developing and applying the method. The method. So mm -hmm. I developed it, like did some sim simulations to, as a proof of concept. And then I went and experimentally applied this characterization on multiple device structures. Yeah. So uh, while we're talking about testing, uh, another question that might come up is when you're testing in a lab, 
your light source might be different from the actual real life solar uh, mm -hmm. spectrum, right? So how do you make sure the two are comparable? Because at the end of the day, yeah. your solar cell has to go into the real world. Yeah, that's right. So, so generally we use uh, solar simulators. So these are uh, special lamps that simulate the solar spectrum. Nearly exactly like they simulate the, they use xenon lamps. They are quite good at uh, helping us simulate the solar spectrum. Yeah. Mm. So it's a standard, uh, they call it 1.5 G illumination. Uh, no, sorry, 1.5 AM illumination. So this is the solar spectrum that reached the Earth's surface. Because it's different from the one that's in the outer space, for example. Yeah, that's another question I had. So is the efficiency higher in space? Like I would satellites? imagine so. I would imagine so. You'll have more more of the solar spectrum to absorb and convert it into, into energy. So I'd imagine so, yeah. But can we also simulate that uh, mm -hmm. spectrum? Uh, not sure about that, if any. Not sure, actually. Because, actually, that's another question I had, which is where... Where is the majority of solar cells used? Are they used in power generation on land or in space? Because all satellites... Uh, yeah, all satellites, they have uh, so solar cells, but mm. I think they're on Earth, I think. The majority of mm. the solar cells uh, used now are on Earth. Live. Is it not an issue, or is the development pathway not different for the two? For a space application mm -hmm. versus a land application? might be a little bit different like you try to um, consider things like the high ultraviolet radiations and how to protect your solar cell from that and so on yeah there might be some different considerations yeah but in terms of the operation mechanism and efficiency i think it's quite similar so if, if we go back to the the practical aspects of perovskites right as a whole or with your method um i think one of the biggest challenges in, in like operational solar cells is they get uh dirty right they have a lot of dust on yeah, them or something yeah like. yeah yeah this is uh, this is an issue i think yeah the dust accumulation on the surface is, is one issue but i'm not sure how people are trying to <laughs> to overcome that uh, that problem i think cleaning mainly people are trying i think to develop automated cleaning or something like that to help streamline the process yeah right but as a material um if you were decoded with something like uh, hydrophobic coating, right? Uh -huh. Does that now mess up the the previous oh. stuff you were doing with the solvents and the spin coating and everything? Oh no! Usually, when like if you envision the final product, you you'll have something that's encapsulated and protected from the external environment. Ideally, yeah. So it's usually encapsulated. It should be encapsulated at least for proskite. They must not sure. They must be be encapsulated because yeah, they're quite sensitive to the external environment. Right. So if, if you had some sort of external like shock even they wouldn't mess up the internal shock like uh, physical yeah like mechanical shock it shouldn't, shouldn't. or like high energy it shouldn't affect no I don't, I don't think it should have any impact on the device right yeah. right so anything else regarding your work that we have not covered uh, so far i think we have covered everything we covered yeah okay much everything. uh so now i want to ask about where is this going, the future? Are, is there, for example, a Gen 4 of solar cells with new materials coming? Um, I'm not sure. I think proskites are the most new thing, the most, like, the latest kind of technology that uh, came in. Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if there is any, anything else besides mm -hmm. like proskites, yeah. Not sure at this moment. But who knows, maybe in the future we'll find new materials that are stable and better than proskites and that that would be a good thing so th there's still potential for yeah there is potential but uh, like if you think about proskites nowadays there are still issues to be resolved for example before uh, we can commercialize them a lot of issues still so um, so perhaps maybe i can share a couple of them so one issue is the stability so this number i think it's not it should be number one issue with proskites the stability what do you mean by stability? Yeah, sure. So basically, under the exposure of external stressors, proskites would start to degrade and the performance will start to go down dramatically. So by stressors, I mean things like oxygen and moisture. Like number one, oxygen, moisture. And we have also elevated temperatures and uh, 
extended or prolonged illumination, exposure to light for a long, long time. That would also cause device degradation and loss in performance. So these are some outstanding issues to be resolved. Uh, with regards to the oxygen and moisture issue, I think it, it's manageable using proper encapsulation where you completely encapsulate the device and protect it from the external environment. Now the issue remaining is to try to <coughs> is to try to deal with the temperature stability problem. Like at, at elevated temperature, will the device still maintain its performance or not for extended uh, operation? Also, under illumination for long hours, long time, like years or months, will it still maintain its uh, its performance or not? So these are, are some issues to be resolved. I think the second issue, in order to upscale their production and commercialize them, um, uh, is to try to develop, to fabricate devices or solar cell modules, like large, large scale devices. So basically in a, a, res a research solar cell, like in the laboratories, um, they are very tiny, like the active area is around 0 0.1 centi centimeter square. It's quite small. So we have to find a way to scale up their production because so the method we use for fabrication is spin coating. Spin coating is only applicable if you if you if your device is small, because in a large area you need the entire layer to be uniform, very uniform. But that's not the case in spin coating. So people need to figure out a way to fabricate devices at a large scale, large uh, size, that are also efficient at the same time. So yeah, I think there are a lot of groups around the world who are trying to achieve that. I think including here, in, like in NTU, like uh, in 2020, I guess, um, like they, they broke a record in terms of large solar cell. I think it was 21 centimeters square. Um, the size of the module with an 18.1 efficiency or something like that. So it's quite impressive. So yeah, people are doing great work in that regard, I think. Yeah. And so one of the factors you mentioned is prolonged uh, operation, yeah. right? Or temperature. Mm -hmm. Does this tie back into higher recombination rate? Uh, of course, like uh, after the device starts to degrade with time and uh, under exposure to these stressors, uh, it's normal that the recombination will start to increase, 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 and the performance will go down dramatically. So w what is that degradation specifically? Like if, if it's been under illumination for years, like uh, basically, yeah. So there are some chemical instability issues. For example, there is a, uh, I think something that happens quite often with proskites is ion migration. So the ions they will start move move around, and they, for example, will accumulate at the interface or cause some chemical reaction. Or ions from the metal electrode will start to migrate into the proskite and cause a lot of a lot of trouble and issues, or introduce new defects and. Uh, accelerate recombination and things like that. Yeah. And these stability issues, I'm guessing, are not present in first-gen devices? Yeah, I think silicon devices are quite stable. Like they, they can, I think the lifetime of a silicon solar cell is typically 25 years or something like that. Like tens of years. Yeah. So that's one issue, stability. One issue. And the second issue, as I mentioned, is the trying to upscale their fabrication into mm -hmm. larger devices. Yeah. Large, large uh, Light solar cells. Right. Is that purely a manufacturing uh, issue? More or less, I think, yeah. Yeah, trying to develop a method that's compatible with large scale uh, production. Yeah. Because right. spin coating is not viable for that. And what about the, their energy production capability? Uh, do, do you see a future where cities rely only, let's say, on renewable energy? Because uh, what I heard recently was that it seems kind of uh, a very hard thing to achieve because of all the materials we need to build all these like solar cells and yeah, uh, I think also converters. Yeah. that's right. I think yeah. One, also, one of the issues I think is the aesthetic aspect of solar cells. Some people talk about that, and then another issue is the space they they, they need. But I think in the future, people are moving toward uh, renewable energies. So I think it's inevitable to see some increase in the adoption of solar cells yeah, around the world, I believe so. Because hmm. yeah. you're saying these uh, proskite materials are cheaper, cheaper. therefore, yeah. but uh, 
can then can we then you know rely on them completely well if they prove themselves to be like stable and viable and effective and efficient and uh, low cost so it, so if you if you can obtain uh, low cost per watt produced or low yeah low cost per per unit energy produced then i think they can be economically viable and applied on, on a large scale why not mm. yeah and working, people are working on these issues, right? The stability yeah. and the scaling. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I think there are, there are also some but startups. There are improvements. Yeah, yeah, there are some startups actually trying to commercialize proscat solar cells. For example, I think there is one in, in the US. There are two. One, I think one called uh, Swift Solar. They are trying to uh, build flexible proscat solar cells. There's one, one advantage also. You can make flexible devices that are wearable or you can use them for applications that need flexible devices. Um, so there is a Swift Solar, there is another one called, I think, Tandem PV. They're trying to uh, use perovskites in conjunction with uh, silicon, silicon solar cells to build tandem devices, they call them. I think there in the UK, there is one called Ox Oxford PV as well. They're trying to also apply perovskites in, in tandem devices. Yeah. I think another uh, really big consideration for like large scale application uh, of these like newer technologies is what is the end of life uh, for something like this, right? Exactly. So once your perovskite solar cell is is done, you know it's degraded. What happens to it? Like how do you dispose how of you dispose it? Dispose it exactly. One more issue for you. So, so the one of the biggest issue with perovskites is that they contain uh, lead, which is a toxic heavy metal. So this is another concern regarding to the environment and. Uh, health and so on. So we need to find out how we will perhaps develop uh, standard ways of disposing these materials or uh, recycling them somehow and b using them again to make solar cells. So there are a lot of work needed to, uh, to do that. Yeah. So this is like a whole other research area. Other research direction. Yeah, it's active actually. Also people are trying to use perovskite materials that, uh, that uh, like do not contain any lead in them. Yeah, this is another active area of research as well. Yeah. And these can't be easily repurposed in any way? Which one? The lead free? Or like the normal ones are, are, are the ones with lead, right? Uh, yeah. The usually the one that give good efficiency, top efficiency is <laughs> has lead. Right. This is a theme that you will find a lot in uh, material <laughs> material science. <laughs> Cadmium and and uh, and lead, yeah, they're present also in quantum dots as well, lead and cadmium. Yeah. Right, right. So, is there, were, were there any, uh, was there any kind of research that you came across, you know, just by chance the of, of how to like repurpose perovskite cells? I, I think I came across one, one research done by a group. I think they tried to recycle uh, the perovskite material itself and use it again to to fabricate the same proskite device and they obtain a good efficiency like uh, even after repurposing the same materials so i think it's viable yeah yeah it's viable but we need to uh, at least develop some standard methods to to do this in a large scale yeah right right yeah. probably the the recycling would probably be the easiest right like plastic recycling where you just use it to make it again use it to make it again exactly Exactly. Right. Anything else you would like to share? Um, yeah, I think that's it. I don't have anything in mind now. <laughs> I think we've pretty much covered everything we covered. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting topic uh, yeah. with pretty pretty substantial implications, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Energy generation is a huge issue moving sure. forward. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so because you are one of the founders of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be interesting to probe your mind about that. Um, just were you part of any other uh, societies or like activities as a postgrad? No, I would say the the hit podcast is the main thing for me. Yeah, I haven't been part of any like activities or or clubs or anything like that. Right, and we'll ask the other two founders uh, as well. But how did this podcast like? How did the idea come around, and and how did you guys? like move it forward 
Well, we, uh, I mean, initially we used to come every once in a while, every Wednesday, chat about different topics and discuss different things. Um, but bit by bit, we thought, oh, maybe maybe we can start making a podcast about this. Why? Like, we're having a good conversation. Why not record it? Yeah. So we had the idea. Slowly, we started thinking and brainstorming different idea how we can run this uh, this podcast. How we can how we how do we structure the conversations? How we can manage to get and attract the guests and so on. So slow, a bit by bit, we started. Yeah, brainstorming and uh, testing and trying different ideas, and slow, slowly, slowly, we we managed to start it. Yeah. And what was the? And, and you can comment on this because you're also <laughs> one of the founders. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what was NTU's response to you wanting to do something like this? Because uh, as far as I know, there is no other like student-led university-wide podcast, right? At this moment. Right, it's actually something we looked into, right? Like we, when we had the idea, we looked into who is NTU, is in NTU is doing this. Uh, I think we found a couple, they were just uh, personal podcasts, like students from NTU doing their own podcasts. But it was not like a student initiative. Uh, yeah, NTU was very welcoming, yeah. We, we had no issues yeah. with uh, the support. And initially, you guys were here in Yunnan Corner. Yeah, same just, room, same place. <laughs> just, just talking for an hour. Yeah. Beyond that, um, if anyone, if any other postgrad student wanted to get into like an activity like this, not necessarily a podcast, but like something they do with their friends and they wanted to take it forward, do you have any advice or anything that you kind of noticed you would have done differently? I mean, I can't think of any. I think sometimes you just need to brainstorm ideas and get input from people who might have some experience doing uh, something similar, perhaps. Yeah, I think brainstorming, asking people for ideas and suggestions and tips and so on. Uh, yeah, I think that's all, all, all I can say, yeah. And now that you've graduated, uh, yeah. where would you like to see those podcasts in like a couple years? Well, definitely I would like to see it uh, continuing and uh, getting new guests, perhaps from uh, other universities, um, other research institutions, perhaps there are a lot of them in, in in Singapore. Perhaps having guests from outside Singapore. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to see that in the future, definitely. So the final thing we usually go over is your personal interests throughout your PhD journey, right? Like, what was it like when you got here? What did you do to keep yourself busy uh, apart from just going to the lab? Well, apart from going to the lab, I think the podcast was something outside my research life that I enjoyed doing very much. Um, Besides that, uh, usually, like uh, I like to meet my friends, some friends to play, uh, to play cards, play board games a lot, uh, in the weekends. Also, going for uh, football games, <coughs> football games, and uh, uh, by myself, sometimes I go for a run or a long walk to to help me de-stress. Uh, what else? Uh, language learning also something I enjoy very much. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That's it, very much. Which languages? Well, mainly Spanish. Spanish. Uh, I've been I've been involved in that Spanish mainly, but uh, French. I'm also interested in French as well. Lately, yeah. That's nice. Mm. All right, Mohammed yeah. Ibrahim. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you for coming down. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Research. It was really good talking to you all. And we'll see everyone next time.